powerful message. Beautifully sung. Beautifully sung. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and pray and uh, jump right in. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus that is definitely there for us when things are difficult, when things do not make sense. And I pray, Father, that as you carried us in our time of need, that we would be faithful to you when things are good. Please guide us now as we are going to be looking at one of the most difficult topics in our modern day uh, panoply of subjects. As we discuss the topic of the Antichrist, I pray that Jesus would be our teacher. And as we open your word, that you would teach us what you would have us to know. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. All right, um, let's get started. We have a big topic to cover. This is one of the most uh, difficult topics in modern day Christianity is this topic of the Antichrist. And I, I make no apologies that what we're going to look at today, a lot of people find it to be politically incorrect. But unfortunately, being politically incorrect isn't what Jesus was about. He wasn't worried about whether or not he was going to offend someone. He always shared the truth, but he did it with love. And hopefully, as we go through this topic today, you'll be able to find some semblance of love and compassion and mercy because Jesus shared it in exactly that light. And I guarantee you, or as they say in Louisiana, I guarantee that uh, if it's done in an offensive manner, it's not because the scriptures did it with that way. It's because the donkey that preached was faulty. So you guys pray for me as we go through this, but we have a lot of information to cover, so let's jump right in. Let me ask you this question as we get started. How important is your relationship with God? How important is your relationship with God? Is it more important than your job? Is it more important than your education? Is it more important than money? Than that number in the bank account? Is it more important than your family? Is it more important than your wife or kids? Is he more important than television? Than your computer? Than your telephone? You know, I started thinking about that before. You know, before I preach to you guys, you guys realize that I actually have to write this. And so I was really challenged because I thought to myself, you know what? It's easy, and I'll, I'll just put it on the next slide. It's easy. Uh, we say, of course, we're at church. You know, what else are we going to say? So we answer yes. But I wonder if someone were to follow me around and saw how I spend my money, how I spend my time, how I manage my resources, how I use my words and actions, if they would say the same thing about me. Think about it. Let's go back. If God is more important to me than my job, then I should really not be wondering what I want to do with my life. I should be asking God, what job do you want me to have? Is he more important than my education? Do I wake up in the morning and spend time with him before I start my school day? Or do I just need to get that homework assignment done? How about money? This is, this is the one that really hits us. We always say that God is the most important thing in our lives, but when it comes to our bank accounts, if we have to put them together, whether we're going to trust God with our finances or whether we're gonna, just going to pay what we need to pay, a lot of us, to be honest, it's, just, it's a guarantee that money is, we trust in money more than we trust in God. It's true, absolutely true. Because it said that in any given church, I think it's 20% of people return a faithful tithe and offerings. And this is not Adventist. This is Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, etc. Go to any church. 20% of people are returning a faithful tithe. Not even to mention an offering. Is he more important to you than your money? Is he more important to you than your family? Than your wife or your kids? This is the one that really got me. I spend more time probably on my computer than I spend time with Jesus on any given day. Guaranteed. I probably spend more time on my phone, talking on my phone, than I do talking to Jesus in prayer on any given day. And so I have to really seriously ask myself the question, is God, uh, is my relationship with God more important to me than etc.? God shouldn't come first in your life. Did you read that right? God should not 
come first. God should be everything. And everything else should stem from that relationship. Because the problem is, when we put God first, then after that we take Him aside, and then we have something else that comes second. But God doesn't want to ever be second. He wants to be everything. And your relationship with God should influence everything else that you do. So instead of God being first, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, God is like a circle, and there's a bunch of lines that come out of it. So because of my relationship with God, that's how I act at work. Because of my relationship with God, it influences the programs that I watch or don't watch on the television. Because of my relationship with God, it's going to influence who I do or do not date. It's going to influence how I dress in the morning. It's going to influence how I talk to that married person. It's going to influence how I talk to my spouse. It's going to influence how I talk to the church members. It's going to influence how I live my life. Because if God is first, there's going to be a time where he has to take second place. But if he's everything, then every single aspect of your life is indicative of your relationship with God. And by the way, just to put it out there, for many of us that do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's an experiential relationship. That is actually a living, growing relationship with Jesus. We intellectually assent to truths, but it hasn't changed our lives. This is very important. Please catch what I'm telling you now, because at the end of the sermon, I'm going to come back to this point. For many of us, we have intellectually assented to the truths of Christianity, but it has not changed our lives. I'm coming back to that. All right. People all the time, I've actually been to the academy and I've had, literally had people ask me this question. They say, oh, come on, pastor, it's not that big of a deal. Will God send me to hell because I watched this movie? Will God send me to hell because I visit this website? Will God send me to hell if I date this girl? Will God send me to hell if I have sex before I'm married? And the one I actually had was, will God send me to hell if I drink? I want to know, really, is God going to send me to hell if I have a drink of alcohol? Really? And I asked him and I looked at that person and I said, actually, I think you're setting up a question that leads you to a false answer. That's a, that's a dichotomy that doesn't exist. The real question is this. Is this activity, whatever it may be, at the, the person who asked me was drinking, so I'm just going to go ahead and use that one. I told him this. I said, look, the real question is this. Is this activity, drinking, is it going to lead you closer in your relationship with Christ or farther away? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Because God's not in the business of throwing anyone into hell. Think about it. How... How, it borders on asinine, to be honest. It's, it's one of the most ridiculous statements I've ever heard. Why would God send Jesus on such an expensive errand to planet Earth to redeem the lost race, to have them have a chance to come back to him, only to want to throw them into hell for something that they did wrong? Does that make any sense? That God would send his only begotten son to die for us, to want to be there for us, only to say, well... Yeah, hell for you. That doesn't make any sense. God is not in the business of trying to throw people into hell. He's actually, him and all of heaven are doing everything they can to keep you from going there. So that's not really the question because God doesn't want to throw anybody into hell. Actually, he says he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God is in the business of saving people. The devil's interested in throwing you to hell. Okay, so this is the question. Is this activity going to lead you closer in your relationship with Christ or farther away? And you have to be honest enough to answer that question. Is that TV show, is that movie, is that soundtrack, is whatever the case may be, is it leading you closer to Christ or farther away? And if it's leading you closer to Christ, then by all means, prayerfully move forward. But if it's going to lead you away from Christ, then I would really reconsider the choice. Because you do not want to get into the habit of separating yourself from God. Um, we did that. That's what I just said. You have to guard your relationship with God above everything else. Why do you say that, Pastor? Why is that so important? Two verses of Scripture. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now catch this. Many people, many people will say to me on that day or in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These are people who acknowledge God as Lord and are actually doing good things. Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never, what's that next word? Knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So even though they said that God was Lord, even though they did the right things, there's going to come a time in which Jesus comes back for a second time, and not a few, but many, many will say, what's going on? And God will say, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know you. If that doesn't scare you, the fact that it doesn't scare you should. Notice this verse. John 17, 3, the definition of eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I want you to notice, why were they not able to go into heaven? Jesus says, I never knew you. And then all of a sudden he says that the definition of eternal life is knowing God. Literally, it all boils down to whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of life or death. It's in a matter of eternal life or eternal death. You could be coming to church every single week and live a good life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, this is a, your life is in peril. You're like, this is not a happy sermon. <laughs> It's a dangerous sermon because your eternal life depends on it. Okay, if I were to sit here and tell you that it's not important, I would lie to you. I'm telling you, whatever your decision is, that movie is not worth your eternal life. That girl, that boy is not worth your eternal life. You need to guard your relationship with Jesus above everything else. So I wonder if the enemy knew that keeping your relationship with God strong would be so important that he would make a counterfeit. I wonder if perhaps he knew that knowing God, catch this, that knowing God and being in a relationship with God, since it's so important, what could he do to ruin that? Because anything that gets in the way, catch this, anything that gets in the way of your personal living, breathing relationship, experiential relationship with Jesus, is something that could ruin your life. So I wonder if he planned on making something that would do that. According to the Bible, he did. And that's where the Antichrist comes in. Okay? We're going to do a little Bible study this morning. I want you to notice the screen. I put a lot here because with so much stuff that we have to cover, um, we're going to have to run. So there's few names for this antichrist power in the Bible. First of all, the famous one is found in John. It's called the antichrist. John also uses it in Revelation 13 and calls him the beast or the beast that rises out of the sea. Paul calls him the man of sin and the son of perdition. And in Daniel chapter 7, it's known as the little horn. Same entity, same power, these individuals talking about the same thing, except John, only the one that calls him the Antichrist. The Antichrist is used in these verses of Scripture. Okay? They're all in 1 John and 2 John. And I'm going to let you write them down because I'm hoping that today you won't believe a word that I say. I'm hoping this will open up your thirst for biblical knowledge and you'll go home and study it for yourself. Okay? What do we learn just to continue? 1 John 2.18 tells us there isn't one Antichrist, there are many. The Antichrist actually come out from us, the church. That's very interesting. The Antichrist, a lot of people nowadays expect the Antichrist to be some big uh, militant opposition to Christianity. But actually the Bible says it comes out from the church. It, 1 John 2.22 denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. 
1 John 4, 3 says there is a spirit of Antichrist. And 2 John 1, 7 says it's a deceiver who has gone out into the world. Now, that's a really interesting point, deceiver. What is a deceiver? Yeah, it's a liar. But notice, if someone knows that you're lying, are you being deceived? No, the essence of deception is that you think it's true. Are you with me? The only way you can be deceived is if you think that lie is actually true and you believe it. Because if you know it's a lie and you believe it anyway, that's just weird. And there are people like that. We lie to ourselves all the time, right? I'm not gaining weight. Those six extra slices of cheesecake did nothing for my figure. Right? Some of you are smiling. Yes, I'm that kid, okay? All right. Let's keep going. So, we did the Antichrist. The next one is Paul and the Antichrist. We're going to actually read this one from the Bible. So, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. If you do not have your Bibles, don't worry, I have it on the screen. If you can't find Thessalonians, it's in the New Testament. It's kind of towards the middle-ish, maybe a little bit more towards the back. And if you can find any book with T, all the books that are in the Bible that begin with T are in the same place and they're in alphabetical order. Okay? So, if you can find one, you can find all of them. If you, don't, if you don't have your Bible, have it on the screen. 2 Thessalonians, starting chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. i got to switch my slide. There you go. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he, what's that next word? Is God. I want you to notice something very interesting. Um, let's go back. Calls him two names. The first name is the man of sin. And the second name is the son of perdition. This is very interesting because son of perdition is only used two times in the entire Bible. The first is actually found in John 17, 12. Jesus' prayer. He says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept. And none of them is lost except the who, everyone? Son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Well, who is the son of perdition that Jesus Tried to keep but couldn't. Judas Iscariot. Whoever this Antichrist power is, the Bible says that it's going to match. The only other individual that it matches is Judas Iscariot. Okay? Judas did not violently oppose Jesus. He subtly did what? Betrayed him. He came not from the violent opposition to the Pharisees or from the Romans, but he came from Christ's disciples. That makes sense because in 2 Thessalonians, we already, I mean, in, in uh, 1 and 2 John, we already read that the Antichrist comes from the church. Okay? He looked friendly but secretly betrayed. The Antichrist will not appear as a violent opposer, but as a subtle, what, everyone? Betrayer. And this is my point. Note also that according to verse 4, this is very, very important. The Antichrist goes into the temple not to show that he is against God, but rather that he is God. Now, a lot of us have a problem with this, but in Greek, the word, the preposition anti doesn't always mean against. Sometimes it means instead of. How many people knew that? If you look up in your Strong's Concordance, you go home and you look at the preposition anti, the definition for it is against, but it could also mean instead of. Instead of. Okay, this is not something I'm making up. You can go to any Strong Concordance. It tells you how Greek words are translated. You can look it up for yourself. Okay, so Revelation 13, we're not going to read this. I'm going to fly by this because I want you to go into something. There is a counterfeit motif in the Antichrist, okay? I'm not going to show you this because it's a biblical fact. I'm just going to show you this in the next few seconds because I think it's interesting, okay? Because I think it's what, everyone? You're going to have to stay with me. we got a lot of information to cover. Bear with me, okay? Let's do it. 
In Revelation chapter 13, there's a sea beast that comes out of the sea. Okay, that's why we call it the sea beast. It's just the beast, but it comes out of the sea. The next beast comes out of the earth, and people call it the earth beast. Okay, but the first beast, I want you to notice something. The first beast almost seems to counterfeit the very work of Jesus Christ. For example, the sea beast in verse 1 rises up out of the sea... But Jesus began his ministry with the anointing of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. They both begin coming out of water. Then the sea beast gets his authority from the dragon. But while Jesus was on this earth, he says while his mission on earth, he received his authority from who? The Father. The third thing is the sea beast gets a mortal wound and guess what? It heals. Notice ...that the sea beast never dies. It just gets wounded... ...and then it gets healed. It never dies. Okay? But for Jesus Christ... ...he has a death and a resurrection. Then after the healing... ...the, the, the sea beast receives worship. Jesus after his resurrection... ...receives worship. This is interesting. Um, the guy that I got this from... ...he didn't have this one here. I added this on my own... ...just because I think it's interesting... In verse 4, all the people, after the sea beast resurrects, actually heals, they say, who is like the beast and who is able to make war? Have you ever read that before? Okay. Do you know that that's really, really interesting? Because in Revelation chapter 12, when there's the war in heaven, the one who kicks Satan out is called who? It's called Michael. Does anybody know what Michael means? Who is like God? So very interesting, here, after the beast gets his healing, everybody says, who is like the beast? Who is like the beast? That is a gigantic play on words on Michael, who just kicked him out in the war, where his name means who is like God. So on one side you have who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him, and on the other side you have Michael, who is who is like God, and he kicked the beast out. Okay, just interesting parallels. And finally, the beast is there for 42 months. And how long did Jesus Christ reign? Three and a half years of ministry. Anyone care to guess how many months that is? 42 months. There is a counterfeit taking place with this sea beast and Jesus Christ. Okay, let's keep going. The main, the most, the most voluminous amounts of information about the Antichrist power is actually found in Daniel chapter 7. Okay? We don't have time to go all through Daniel chapter 7. If you've been in prayer meeting, then you'll, you've gotten it from you know, week after week. But turn in your Bibles to Daniel 7. We're not going to go anywhere else today. We're going to spend the majority of our time in Daniel chapter 7. So please turn there with me. Daniel chapter 7. While you're turning there, I'm going to go and just show some fun facts. At the beginning of Daniel 7, Daniel's in vision and he's seeing... These four beasts come out of the sea. Okay? How interesting. Now we know from Revelation 17, 15 that the prophetic symbol for seas is people, nations, nations, multitudes, and tongues. Okay? Wind means war. The beast means kingdom. These are common. These are not Adventist interpretations. These are Baptists and Lutherans and Presbyterians and many other people share the same interpretation. So this is not even close to an Adventist thing yet. Okay? Now, I want you to notice, for some of you that have been in church a very, very long time, in Revelation chapter 13, you have a beast, the beast that comes out of the sea, and it has what? The body of a... Oh, my. A leopard, thank you. It has the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, etc. How many heads does it have? Seven, thank you. How many horns does it have? Ten. Did you know that if you put the four beasts of Daniel's chapter 7 together, you get a lion, a bear, a leopard, and some indescript beasts, and you also get seven heads and ten horns? Very interesting. Okay? This is not an accident that John used this. Daniel cha I mean, Revelation chapter 13 is coming straight from Daniel 7. Okay? I don't have time to show you it because we would be here all day. And I know that putt luck is very important. All right. So let's keep going. 
The first beast, the lion with eagle's wings, represents Babylon. I don't have time to go through all the stuff. I'm just going to have to give it to you, and we'll talk about it later. Okay, if you're interested afterwards to find out why these beasts are this, see me afterwards. Okay, first beast, lion with eagle's wings, represents Babylon. Rules from 605 to 539. Okay, interesting, I put some fun facts. This right here is a picture I took. This is in Berlin, Germany. This is the Pergamum Museum of Berlin, Germany. If you see on the side walls there, those are... Uh, pictures of how it would have been like walking into Babylon, okay? I didn't put the Pergamum gate, um, the gate that was, the Ishtar gate, excuse me, that was actually there at Babylon because it has no importance to what I want to tell you right now. But if you zoom in on these beautiful pictures that were on your way to Babylon, you'll find, here's a close-up, that it's a picture of a lion with, guess what? Eagle's wings. I'll show you. There's the lion, grr, roar, and all this. That right there is an eagle's wing, okay? So, very interesting that the same picture the Bible used to describe Babylon is the same exact animal that was used as you were walking towards Babylon that lined all the walls there. Now, I have other pictures of the Ishtar gate and all that kind of stuff, but it's just, we have way too much today, so let's just keep going. Medo-Persia, 539 to 331 BC, took over Babylon. Cyrus the Great, you can find it in the Cyrus of Cylinder, uh, the Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, Greece came next, the four-headed leopard. Um, Greece went from 331 to 168 BC. And finally, that nondescript, terrible beast that this artist decided to make it Sarah from Lost Before Time. I don't know why it's a triceratops, but that's what it is. Some of you are chuckling because you get that. Other of you are, don't know what I'm talking about. That's okay. All right. So, uh, is Rome, 168 to 8476. Now, I've heard people tell me, well, this is an Adventist interpretation. This is an Adventist interpretation. This is an Adventist interpretation. I want to show you something now that, to me, proves that regardless of what you believe about that, you're going to have a hard time substantiating that claim, okay? Because not only do other churches believe this, Baptist, Pentecostal, blah, 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 but there's something else, okay? Oh, then the ten kings with the ten horns, okay. The ten horns became the ten things, okay. Okay, here it is. There in Germany is a place called Nuremberg. Has anybody ever been to Nuremberg, Germany? Anybody? A couple people? Yes. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. I got to go to the Christmas market there. If you've never gone to Europe during Christmas time, do yourself a favor someday. Go. The Christmas markets are amazing, okay? Um, I was begging my wife to take me to Nuremberg for this exact reason. In Nuremberg, they have a courthouse there. It's a huge courthouse where the Nazi war criminals were tried after World War II. Now, if you go outside of the Nuremberg courthouse and look at the statues that ha they have there, you will find something very, very interesting. On the right side, you're going to see this exact picture here. And I'm going to zoom in on what this is. I'm still trying to find out who built this statue, who was the architect, the, the artist of this statue. But very, very interesting, you're going to find a man here in Babylonian clothes, in Babylonian garb, and right next to him is a what? Anyone can see? That's a lion with what? With wings. How very, very interesting. Then you go to the next side and you see a Persian in Persian garb with a bear. Go over to the next side and you're going to find this. This is clearly Alexander the Great. And if you go here, you'll find a four-headed cat-like figure. And on the other side to him, I don't think anyone can, can argue what this clothing is like. That's obviously Roman. And you see a horrible, terrible beast with, guess what? Ten horns. And I did not have a good camera at this time. But right here in the middle is a little horn. Folks, this is not something that we invented. An Adventist artist isn't the one who put these statues here. This was here long before, way long before. That means back in the day, people knew that this was the biblical interpretation of Daniel chapter 7 and put it in this Nuremberg courthouse for all to see. Folks, I'm not making this stuff up. I've been there. I've taken pictures. I was there. Now, I want to go on record real quick and put a little footnote here because I want to come to this later. But did you know that back in the day, everybody used to know who the Antichrist was? Everyone knew who it was. I'm going to prove that to you later. 
It's only recently, relatively recently, that people have become to become uh, begun to be confused on who the Antichrist actually is. To me, it makes sense because back in the day, they were making statues about it. And everybody knew what it was about. I'm not making this stuff up. I've been there. Okay, let's keep going. So, the little horn is our Antichrist power. I'm going to give you five minutes, okay, maybe less... And I want you to go into Daniel chapter 7, and I want you to find as many clues as possible as to the identification of this little horn. Anything it says about the little horn, I want you to find. So get out your Bibles, turn to Daniel 7. I'm not just going to give you everything. You need to study the truths for yourself. The Bible says, study to show yourself to prove. The workman needeth not be ashamed. So get out your Bibles, Daniel chapter 7. Let's not be pastor dependent. Let's do this from our Bibles. And I want you to find everything you can about the little horn. If you don't have your Bibles, now's a good time to get out your phone. Or if you really want to do this and you don't have a Bible, kind of raise your hand and I'll give you mine. But I'll need it back. Anybody need it? Don't be ashamed. No, no, no. Okay. I don't see any hands. Yes? Perfect. Thank you for your honesty. It's on the right page. Yeah. <laughs> Don't waste this time. Don't just sit there and be like, oh, I hope it's over. No, use this time. Jump into the text. What does the Bible say? Because nobody cares what Pastor Edwin says. I want to know what the Bible says about the Antichrist. So jump into Daniel chapter 7. If you're watching online or streaming this, don't just think this of this as dead space. Use this time. Get out your Bible in front of you. Or if you need some websites, you can go to www.biblegateway.com or Blue Letter Bible that can put the Greek and the Hebrew right next to you. And you can look up Daniel chapter 7. You can hit control F and find every place that has to do with the little horn. That will be your keyword, the horn, and study it out. So if you're online, don't just use this as dead space. Use it. You can go to www.biblegateway.com or Blue Letter Bible or Logos or eSword and use this time to jump into your text. It'll actually be easier online because you can just control F, little horn. Addison, are you helping Daniel? Oh, okay. Can I give you a couple more minutes? Anything you can find. Be a detective. Anything you can find about the little horn. If you're just tuning in and you're online, um, we are now searching our Bibles in Daniel chapter 7 for the identity of the little horn. You can make sure that you go to BibleGateway.com, Daniel chapter 7. We're looking at where is the little horn and any clues we can find out about him. Are the Giborim looking this up?
All right, let's jump in. Let's jump in. Let me steal my Bible. Daniel chapter 7 is where you're going to want to be. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, there's a lot I want to say about Daniel chapter 7, but we're not necessarily preaching on Daniel 7. We're going to be looking at the little horn. So jump with me to verse um, 7, actually. 7-7. Seven, seven. Are we all there? After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Before we begin, let's pray. Ask God to be with us as we jump in. I think it's important for us to do so. Father in heaven, we're going to be taking a look at a very serious subject. And I just want to ask again for your Holy Spirit to guide us in the study of this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, verse 8. As I was considering the horns... There was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Just in that one verse, you should have seen so many clues. Okay? Let's do it. So, he's thinking about the horns, and there there was another horn. So, first clue is that it's a horn. I know, you're shocked. Okay? Second one is that it's a, is it big or small? It's a little horn. And it comes up among them. What are the among them? It's not hard. The other ten horns that came from the fourth beast. Are we together? This is how we do that. You go slow. You look at the details. Now, because of our time here, I can't go through the whole chapter. You can do that on your own at home. What I did is I picked only ten. Ten very obvious identifying factors of the little horn. Are you ready? Let's do this together. I picked ten. So what can we learn about this Antichrist power? Okay? You, I have the verses there so you can look it up yourself. First of all, it's a little kingdom. Now, why did we say little kingdom? Does anybody know? Why are we saying little kingdom? It's because in Bible prophecy, what does a horn represent? A kingdom. And in this chapter, when the angel interprets the dream to Daniel, he says, what is the horn? He says, those horns are ten kings. They shall be kingdoms upon the earth, etc. Okay, so it's a little kingdom, it comes up among them, it comes up after them, when it comes up, it plucks up three, there's a man at its head or has eyes speaking for it, it's diverse or different than all the other horns, it speaks blasphemies or great things, it's a persecuting power, it's persecuting the saints, it changes times and laws, and it reigns for 1,260 prophetic days, okay? You have all the verses there with you. Now let's go through these real quick. Uh, yeah, you know what, let's do that. Real quick, number seven, it says it speaks blasphemies. I'm going to go ahead and do this one. What does the Bible mean when it says blasphemy? Okay, How does the Bible define blasphemy? I can, th I can say blasphemy is whatever I want. But let's go back into the Bible and say, what does the Bible mean when it says blasphemy? I'll give you two examples. Mark. Jesus is there, and uh, I'll read it, the text. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But they were certain, oh, excuse me, but there were certain of the scribes there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but who? God alone. So apparently, Jesus is there. He has this sick person in front of him. And he says, I forgive your sins. And the Jewish people lost their minds. They're like, what are you talking about? That's blasphemy. Because any man that claims to have the power to forgive sins is... It's not hard. Is, starts with a B, ends with blasphemy. Blasphemy. Okay, so our first definition according to the Bible is a man claiming to have the power to forgive sins. Now, was Jesus committing blasphemy? No, because why? Because he was God. He has the right to forgive sins. Okay, second definition, John chapter 10, verses 30 to 33. Jesus says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. I love Jesus' answer. This is how I know Jesus had a sense of humor. He's about to be stoned and notice how he replies. Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? I think that's hilarious. 
I think it's so funny. Jesus is about to be stoned. He has all these things. He does like, I've done many good things. Which of these good things are you stoning me for? I think it's funny. You may not think it's funny. I think it's hilarious. How do they respond? The Jews, again, lose their minds. And they say, for a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Why? Because that thou, being a man, make yourself or make thyself God. So, again, was Jesus committing blasphemy? No, because he's God. But if I sit in front of you today and I tell you, and I'm not, but if I tell you that I'm God, what does the Bible say? It says that's blasphemy. By the way, if you have any questions of whether or not I'm God, just talk to my mother. She'll let you know. She's like, no, that kid, we need to pray for him. All right. So, second definition, a man claiming to be God, the Bible calls that what, everyone? Blasphemy. Are we together so far so good? All right, let's keep going. Oh, I did that thing I wasn't supposed to do. Oh, never mind. It works. Ignore that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, real quick, the 1,260 prophetic days. There's a whole lot that has to do with the Jewish year only having 360 days. To make it as easy as possible, if you don't believe me, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, the woman goes into the wilderness for 1,260 days. And in Revelation 12, 14, it says a time, times, and a half a time. They're the same thing. Okay? So that time, times, and a half a time, time just means a year. Times is two, half a time, half a year. Okay? It adds up to 1,260. It's confusing. I can explain it slower and more methodically. We just have a lot to cover. The easiest way I can do it is if you go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, it says that 1,260 days is the same exact thing as time, times, and half a time. Easiest way to explain it. If you like it the more complicated way, one year, 360, two years, 720, half a year is 180, leads us to 1,260. Okay? So, who is the Antichrist? Before we just blurt it out, who is this Antichrist power in the Bible? The easiest way to say this is, before we begin, is God is in the business of loving everyone. Okay? He loves everybody. Okay? And it's important for me to say this because this touches my family probably more than it touches your family because of my culture. Okay? Because of my background, because of where I come from, this is a lot harder on us than it probably would be on you. Okay? So for me to say this to my own family members is a lot harder than for me to stand up and say it in front of you. But who or whom or what is the Antichrist according to the Bible? According to the Bible, there is only one possible, one possible explanation for who the Antichrist is. And by the way, everyone used to know it. And that is the Roman church state, otherwise known as the Catholic church. You say, that's impossible. That is absolutely impossible. There's no way. Well, look, don't, don't get mad at me. Let's go through the list, okay? Number one, is it a little kingdom? Okay, Vatican City, this is from the encyclopedia, is a landlocked sovereign city-state whose territory consists of a walled enclave within the city of Rome at approximately 44 hectares, 110 acres, and with a population of around 800, is the smallest independent state in the world, both by population and by area. And you say, well, it's not a real country. Folks, the United States has an ambassador to the Vatican. We don't have ambassadors to people groups. You have ambassadors to countries. Okay, it, they have their own money. They have their own guard. It's a Swiss guard, okay? It is a country. Two, did it grow up among the nations of Europe? <laughs> okay, go. There's Vatican City. It's entirely landlocked by... Rome, and it's inside the country of Italy, okay? So did it grow up among Europe? Yes, it did, okay? Anybody ever been to Vatican City, by the way? Show of hands, anybody? Have a few, okay? Is it still in Europe? Okay, good. All right, keep going. Did it grow up after the ten nations of Europe were starting to be established, okay? Um, History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD when they went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian, making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. Okay, basically what that happened is Constantine moved the capital, left a void in Rome, and he left the Bishop of Rome in charge. Okay, did it pluck up three? When the Pope came to ascendancy, did three nations fall? Remember, they're horns. Did three kingdoms fall? 
Um, we look at the ten tribes again. The, the, by the way, does anybody know what these things are? The Visigoths are the Spanish, the Suevi are the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese, the Francs are the French, Anglo-Saxons are the British. These are the barbarian tribes that eventually came modern, modern Europe. We okay with that? Everybody okay? Okay. So, what happened? Of the ten divisions of old Rome, notice this, seven accepted the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. How many? Seven. That leaves how many, good mathematicians? How many were plucked up by the roots? Okay. The other three opposed his supremacy. War was made on these three. The last of these opposing powers, the Goths, were overthrown in 538 AD. The same exact time where they started to reign. This gave Papal Rome the undisputed supremacy and thus the 1,260 days uh, began in 538 AD. Do they have a man at its head? Title is again encyclopedia, Catholic dictionary. Title of the visible head of the Catholic Church, he's called the Pope. Okay, I don't think we need to belabor that. Is it different than any other country? Of course. I'm not going to read you this. It's quotes. I, it's the only place that you know that the Pope and the religious leaders in charge of the whole country, right? I'm not in charge of gentry. Many of you praise the Lord for that, right? We'd be having bomba tournaments all the time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. All right. So, it's, it's different from any other country. Does it speak blasphemies? Okay, let's go through this again. Real quick, what were the definitions of blasphemy? Number one, a man claiming to have the power to... And number two, a man claiming to be God. Okay, let's look at it. Number one, this is from Ferraris' uh, Ecclesiastical Dictionary. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. Does anybody know what vicar means? It means substitute. Okay? For thou art the shepherd, thou art the husbandman, the director, thou art, excuse me, I skipped that. Thou art the director, thou art the husbandman, finally thou art another God on earth. Okay? This is from History of the Councils, published in 1672. Um... On April 30, 1922, Pope Pius XI said, You know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth, the vicar of Christ, the substitute of Christ, which means that I am God on the earth. Um, on the councils, uh, authority of councils, book 2, chapter 17, volume 2, page 266. All the names which the scriptures are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he's over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. Um, a Pope and a Scandal and a Mystery. Confronted with the Pope... Um, by the way, this is written by John Paul II. Does anyone know who that is? Very famous Pope. Lived like two Popes ago. Okay. I've never said Pope so many times in my whole life. <laughs> Confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the, uh, of the Trinity. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. This is not what I'm writing. This is their books. We're just quoting. Um, December 20, 1935, Pope Pius XI. Thus the priest, as is said with good reason, is indeed another Christ, for in some way he is a continuation of Christ. Pope Leo XIII... Uh, we, the Pope, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Folks, with all due respect, and, and, and like I told you, I'm from a Hispanic background. I can't tell you, we come from Catholic countries, okay? I can't tell you with all the respect for my family members who are still Catholic and all this, with all due respect, the Bible calls this blasphemy, period. This is blasphemy. The Catholic, the Catholic National July uh, 1895. Thou art a priest forever, says the ordaining bishop. He's no longer man, a sinful child of Adam, but an altar Christus, another Christ. Okay? We don't have to go through all this. Catholic Encyclopedia. The judicial authority will even include the power to do what's those next two words. Forgive sins. Okay? Dignities and duties of the priest, volume 12, page 27. God himself. Now notice this. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest and either not to pardon or to pardon. According to the book for the priest, God has to do whatever the priest say. So if the priest pardons you, then God has to pardon you. And if the priest doesn't pardon you, God won't pardon you. That's a serious claim. According as they refuse or give absolution, the sentence of the priest proceeds and God subscribes to it. 
This is their literature, okay? Um, this is uh, Joseph Darby's catechism. The priest does really and truly forgive sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. I did that thing I wasn't supposed to do again. Okay. Um, Catholic priest, page 78. Seek where you will find through heaven and earth and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Pope John Paul II on Tuesday told Roman Catholics to seek forgiveness through the church and not directly from God. The requirement for confessing sins through priests is one of the fundamental principles of Roman Catholicism. The Associated Press, December 11, 1984. Um, by the way, this is a trick question. And I had the privilege, by the way, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you the story because we won't have time today. But um, I had the privilege of going to Notre Dame and interviewing a priest. I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Well, not a one. It was like three-on-one -on conversation with him. Got to talk to him. He had two dissertations, one from the Vatican. I got to ask him, how does forgiving sins work in the Catholic Church? His answer was extremely interesting. Extremely unbiblical, but extremely interesting. If you're interested in that, I'll talk to you later about it. Um, but I want to ask you this question because it's important and I've heard it before and I agree with it. Do you need a priest in order to come to Jesus? Or in order to come to God? Do you need a priest to forgive your sins? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. But do you have a priest according to the Bible? Yes, you do. His name is Jesus Christ. Okay? First Timothy 2 says, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. Who is that? The man Christ Jesus. He is your priest. When you're going to ask for forgiveness of sins, you don't go to a person. You go to Jesus Christ. So, um, is it a persecuting power? The church is persecuted. Only a tyro in church history will deny that. That word means a beginner, okay? Um, that the church has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. We're going to go through this. Um... If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, History of the Popes, uh, I'll just read this one. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives, children stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. So did the church persecute? Of course it did. Okay, there's tons of evidence to that. Actually, so much so, in fact, that John Paul II actually apologized for what he called, quote, the excesses of the church during the Inquisition. All right, did it change times and laws? I want you to notice this quote carefully. This is from Pompta Bibliotheca. It says, The Pope is of so great authority and power that he is able to modify, declare, or interpret even divine laws. You know, I don't necessarily have a big problem with declaring, right? I don't even really have a problem with interpreting. You know, you gotta, gotta work with the text and what you find. I have a huge problem with this word. What does that word mean? To change. The Pope is of so great authority that he has the power to change God's law. And, to, you know, to be honest, as a Protestant, as a Protestant, I believe in the Bible and the Bible only. I don't believe any man has the right to change God's law or the Bible. Okay? Um, Converts Catechism on Catholic Doctrine. This is the thing that they give you when you become a Catholic. Okay? And it's written in question and answer format. Uh, let me tell you real quick before we jump into this. Did the Catholic Church change God's times and laws or attempt to change God's times and laws? If you pick up any convert's catechism, the Ten Commandments for the Catholics are different than what you have in your Bible. Did you know that? The second commandment is gone. That whole thing about worshiping idols, that doesn't exist anymore. They took it out. So it goes from one to three. Now, they only have nine commandments. That didn't sound so good. You know, Charlton Heston wouldn't have been happy. So they changed it and the tenth one became two. They split it in half. And they changed the fourth one about the Sabbath. They moved it to number three. And they just said, instead of remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, they just said, remember the Lord's day. I want you to, interesting, Converts Catechism, notice what it says. Which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred some limity from Saturday to Sunday. Ancient church, in the interval between the days of the apostles and the conversions of Constantine rites and ceremonies, of which neither Paul nor Peter ever heard, crept silently into use and then claimed the ranks of divine institutions. Okay, I hope that made sense. If not, uh, let me just give you an easy one. Uh, James Cardinal Gibbons, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. Um, we're just going to keep that one. Catholic Encyclopedia. Just keep going. 
Um, this is a good one. Carl Keating, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. Fundamentalists, that means people that actually believe the Bible, meet for worship on Sunday, yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath, or day of rest, was of course Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. All right, this is a very interesting quote. Notice the screen. When Protestants, this is asking Catholics, asking Catholics. When Protestants, that's uh, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, etc. When Protestants do profane work upon Saturday or the seventh day of the week, do they follow the scriptures as their only rule of faith? Answer, on the contrary, they have only the tradition, they have only the authority of tradition for this practice. In profaning Saturday, they violate one of God's commandments, which on their principles has never been abrogated. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, this one says that the church is the one that changed Sabbath to Sunday. Sabbath, the Hebrew word signifying rest, Sunday, was the name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day they worshipped the sun. This is the last one I'll read and then we'll skip the rest. Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory and not logically to keep Saturday with the Jews. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants a transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Actually, Catholics are extremely cocky about this. There was one uh, Catholic priest who was willing to give out one thousand dollars to every single bible verse that would show you that you had to worship on sunday and to this day nobody has asked for the money catholics will tell you we we had a, a person named bakioki who got his dissertation in the vatican that did his dissertation that the seventh day is the sabbath and you know what the catholics say that's right the seventh day remember the sabbath day to keep holy is the seventh day saturday they say we worship on sunday because the catholic church has the right to change god's commands and they ask the protestants who who say that they believe in the bible now i have only why do you keep sunday um let's just go oh this one's important there is one church on the face of the earth that has the power or claims power to make laws binding on the conscience, binding before God and binding under the penalty of hellfire. For instance, the institution of Sunday. What right has any other church to keep this day? Stop doing that. You answer by virtue of the third, notice, the third commandment, which says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. But Sunday is not the Sabbath. Any schoolboy knows that Sunday is the first day of the week. Um, I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who will prove by the Bible alone that Sunday is the day we are bound to keep, and no one has called for the money. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day from rest from Saturday, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day of the week. Um, we're just going to have to stop. Uh, God says he doesn't change, etc. Okay. So, did it rule for 1,260 days? I'm just going to explain this. The Catholic Church started at 538. According to the Bible, that means in 1,260 years, something had to happen that would really ruin it. Okay? If you go from 538, you go all the way 1,260 years, it brings you to the year 1798. Does anybody know? If this is true, something bad happened, had to happen to the Catholic Church in 1798. If this is true. Does anybody know what happened to the Catholic Church in 1798? During this time, there was a man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, okay? He was a Corsican, and he was tired of the Catholic Church having so much power, so he sent in his general, Berthier, to go into Rome and capture the Pope as a prisoner, and the Pope died in exile. And many people thought that from then on, the Vatican was dead. Here's it from Church History, page 24. The murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798, the exact time gave the French an excuse for occupying the eternal city, that's the Vatican, and putting an end to the papal temporal power. The aged pontiff himself was carried off into exile to Valence, and the enemies of the church rejoiced, and during that time they said the last pope, they declared, had reigned. We're, we're gonna have to go through. Oh, uh, we gotta read this one. Half, half of Europe thought that Napoleon's veto would be obeyed, and with that, the Pope and the papacy was dead. That happened at the exact time the Bible said it would. So the question is, what's going to happen? The Bible tells us that there's going to be a time where this deadly wound is going to be healed. And if you notice nowadays, all the world, the Bible says in Revelation 13, 3, I'll just read it. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world is going to wander after the beast. Let me ask you, ever since that time, has the Catholic Church been gaining in ascendancy? 
When the Pope came to visit the United States, he was on every single channel in this country. It's a hand in glove fit. Nobody else could have it. Now, you say, and I'm going to fly through this because I'm already taking you longer than I want, but this is really important. Bear with me for five more minutes, all right? We got this? Five. Ish. I'm going to show you some quotes because a lot of people say this is Adventist, this is Adventist, this is Adventist, this is Adventist. Notice the screen with me, please. Martin Luther. What was Martin Luther? He was a Catholic, everybody. Martin Luther was a Catholic. He did not want to leave the church. It was only until the Pope excommunicated him that he started wanting to follow the Bible and the Bible only. And he became the father of Luther, uh, Lutheran people. Okay, uh, the Lutheran religion. Notice what he says. Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, that's revelation, by the epistles of St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was who? The papacy. This is Martin Luther, folks. There are no Adventists during the time of Martin Luther. Folks, during the time of Martin Luther, there was only one show in town. Anybody know what Catholic means? Universal, that's right. There was the only church in town. Martin Luther left and he's like, you know that whole Antichrist thing? That's them. All right. Presbyterians. Presbyterians. John Calvin. Some persons think this too severe in centuries when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. Who are the Presbyterians back in the day calling the Antichrist? The Pope. Okay. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself. Notice what they're saying. Don't blame us that we call the Pope the, the Antichrist. That's what Paul in the Bible said. Okay, um, we're just going to skip this one. John Knox, Scottish Presbyterian, one of the founders. As with Luther, he finally concluded that the papacy was the very Antichrist, the son of perdition whom Paul speaks. Thomas Kramer, an Anglican, whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures and old writers and strong reason. Anybody a Baptist? Know any Baptists? First Baptist pastor in America, Roger Williams. Pastor Williams spoke of the Pope as the pretended vicar of Christ who sits on God over the or sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of his vassals. Back in the day, the Baptist said, Pope is the Antichrist. That's what they believed. Yea, over the Spirit of Christ, of the Holy Spirit, and God himself speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. Westminster Confession of Faith. You can't get more Protestant Christianity than the Westminster Confession of Faith. Notice, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, the son of sin, the son of perdition, and exalt himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Okay, I'm just going to go through. Congregational Theologians by Cotton Mather. John Wethley, the Methodist Church, says that the Pope is the man of sin and the son of perdition. John Wesley, uh, commentary on the Bible. Um, here, we'll read this one. A great cloud of witnesses, Wycliffe, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin, Kramer, 17th century, Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, the men who published the Westminster and the Baptist Confessional of Faith all saw... Oh, it keeps going. Excuse me. Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Riley, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. Okay? Uh, I'm going to stop. I didn't have this in my notes, but I have to share why. Does anybody wonder why everybody back in the day knew that this was true and now nobody knows what it is? Anybody wonder how that came about? I'm going to tell you real quick because it's just so important. The Catholic Church started getting a lot of heat from all these people. By the way, if you're a Protestant, what are you protesting? Huh? It's that you believe that you can hold to the Bible and the Bible only. There is a church system that says you can't. It's the Catholic Church. So if you're Baptist, Lutheran, Adventist, everybody's together saying, we believe that we can follow the Bible and the Bible only. And they saw the Pope as the Antichrist, the Catholic Church system. Now, how did this get muddied? Well, they started getting a lot of heat from all these people. And so they had a council. And somebody said, fix it. Now. And so what happened is, two theologians had a great idea. One of them said that all the prophecies in the Bible already happened in the past. They're like, hmm, that's interesting. 
And then the other guy said, no, 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 no. All the prophecies happened in the future. One called it preterism. One called it, Francisco Rivera, he said it was futurism. And there's going to be a time of trouble. And there's going to be one great man of sin. And there's going to have to be a seven-year tribulation and a rapture and blah, blah, blah. Folks, bear with me real quick. Nowadays, that's what everybody believes. How come nobody believed it back then? Because they knew where it came from and they knew what it was designed to do. It was supposed to take the heat off of the Catholic Church. Now, how do I know that this is a problem? Catch me real quick. This is super important. When the Catholic Church was presented with two entirely mutually exclusive ways of interpreting the Bible, they weren't looking for what the Bible says. Do you want to know how I know this? Because then when they picked one, they didn't just pick one, they picked both. How in the world you as a church are going to be picking two entirely different ways of understanding the Bible? That doesn't make any sense. They picked them both because whatever it took to get the heat off of them was going to work. They weren't looking for truth. They were looking for a way to get out. And that's why today many of our Protestant brothers and sisters believe in preterism or futurism. It didn't come from them. It actually came from the Catholic Church. I want you to notice this quote. We therefore assert, define, and pronounce that it is necessary for salvation that every human being is subject to the pontiff of Rome. That's what the Catholic Church says. Every single person on this planet has to be subject to the pontiff of Rome. Oh, um, backwards. So, why is this important? It's because what is the most important thing in your relationship? Your relationship with God, right? The Bible says you need to have a personal relationship with God. The church says, no, 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 there's many mediators. There's saints, there's the Virgin Mary, go to the priests, go to the purgatory. There's nothing wrong with good Catholic Christians. I'm not saying that Catholic Christians are going to go to hell. There's going to be many Catholics that go to heaven. But as a system, as a system, the church is designed to put things in front of your path to God. Antichrist, someone who sets themselves in the place of God. Folks, your relationship with God is the most important thing in the entire universe. And while many good Catholic people are going to be saved, and I believe that with all my heart, because I have many family members who are Catholic, and I pray to the Lord Jesus that they're going to be saved. But nothing ever should take away your relationship with Jesus, especially not a church structure. You are Protestant for a reason, because you believe in the Bible and the Bible only. And you know what? Every single Protestant church back in the day believed the same exact thing. Don't be ashamed that as Seventh-day Adventists, we still hold this truth, because every single reformer back in the day held the same thing. If you believe this, then you're in the same company with the people who wrote the Baptist manual, who wrote the Luther manual, who did the Anglicans, who did uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm in a Seventh-day Adventist today because I believe in the Bible and that I can live my life according to the Bible and I don't need someone to forgive me of my sins or to have the Pope tell me that unless I come to him, I can't be saved. I believe in the Bible and I believe that Jesus is my priest. The most important thing you can do in your life is have a relationship with Jesus and as we close today, I pray that you'll live that way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, today's day and age, uh, these messages are few and far between because we're so worried about offending someone. But Lord, this hurts me because these are my family members that I want to see in heaven. And I'm not saying that because they're Catholic, they're going to go to hell. You're in the business of saving everyone. There's many going to be many Catholics in heaven. I have no doubt. But Father, as a church structure, this system has been told us in the Bible. To, they've warned us about this system. A system that's trying to take your place. That they say they're God on earth and saying that unless we come to him, we can't be saved. But the truth is, Father, we don't need to go to them. We need to go to Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that each and every one of us here would make a decision to study our Bibles and make our relationship with Christ the most important thing. And no matter what any pope or prelate says, we'll be able to stand on the Bible and the Bible only. Father, that's because we're Protestant and we want to follow you. So please help us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing one verse of Oh How He Loves You and Me, one verse only. i
invite you to go and enjoy this wonderful day with Jesus Christ. You can either join us at the Pollock or go home to your family, but spend some time today with God.